here. So hi there. Thank you for joining us for today's financial training ground pop-up on money concepts for teens and young adults. I'm Jen, a certified credit union financial counselor, and today with me is Amy. We're part of the community engagement team here at Horizon Credit Union. Today's content is brought to you by Green Path Financial Wellness, a Horizon Credit Union partner. Just some quick housekeeping notes before we get started. Everyone has been muted upon entry and we're recording today's webinar. Please feel free to use the chat option to participate and to ask any questions that you may have. There's a workbook available as well for today's topic and the link for that is in the chat currently if you missed it in your event invite. For those of you who are new to Green Path, they're a nonprofit financial counseling and education organization licensed to serve people in all 50 states. Green Path has been helping people on their journey to financial wellness for nearly 60 years. They provide a variety of financial services, including one-on-one -on -one financial counseling, housing counseling, credit report reviews, and debt management. You should know that it's always free and confidential to place a call to Green Path. One-on-one -on -one financial counseling. They can help create a spending plan and provide tools and recommendations to help stick with it. A customized action plan is created with member input, providing specific action items to get on track with financial goals. Housing counseling. They also provide home buyer pre-purchase education, mortgage delinquency, loss mitigation, default resolution, rental counseling, and reverse mortgage counseling. Credit report reviews. To help understand the best way to obtain a credit report, how to read it, what is impacting the score, and opportunities to try and improve the credit score. If you have ever been turned down for a loan, this is a great opportunity to get the knowledge you may need to improve your situation and to get prepared to be able to get a loan in the future. And finally, debt management programs. They specialize in a DMP where the goal is to help clients reduce their monthly payments by potentially reducing interest rates while still paying off the debt in full faster than most people can do on their own. You can call Green Path to take advantage of financial counseling options or explore the free resources on our website at hccu.org. Today, we will discuss the financial topics that matter most to students as they journey through high school, college, and beyond. Here's an outline of what to expect today. Your first job. What will that first paycheck look like? Big decisions. College, trade school, or getting a full-time job? Paying for college. Can it be done without going broke? Your college years. Can you afford more than ramen noodles? Entering the workforce. More income, but also more financial responsibility. And finally, establishing credit and how to use your credit as an asset. All right. So when you're in high school, oops, are we getting an echo? I think just a little bit there first, but. Okay. When you're in high school, it's exciting to think about the future, having a full-time job, earning a real paycheck and having your own place. So what do you think? Do the money decisions you make now matter? When you're younger, you usually have more wiggle room to make mistakes. If you spend all your money, you will likely still have support from a family member. It's okay to make mistakes. In fact, the lessons learned could serve as an inspiration for the future. You've hit the mall and scoured the want ads, turned in multiple job applications, gone on several interviews, and finally landed your first job. It can be pretty exciting making money, making plans to spend that money, and having some financial independence from your parents. Let's take a look at some of the basics like your paycheck. Your first two weeks of work are over and your boss has just handed you an envelope. When you open it, you might be in for a shock. In your mind, you might have calculated, if I earn X amount an hour and I worked 20 hours, then my paycheck should be X multiplied by 20. But for some reason, your check is far less than that. Before you go to your boss and complain, let's clear some things up. The amount of money you can actually cash your check for is called your net pay. This is your gross pay or the hourly rate times the hours of the hour, number of hours you worked minus any deductions. Take a look at page three in your workbook for more information on gross versus net pay as we go through this. 
A deduction is any money taken out of your paycheck to pay for employment benefits and taxes. Taxes that may be subtracted from your gross pay include federal income tax, state income tax, Social Security and Medicare taxes, often listed as FICA on your pay stub, and additional taxes such as city taxes and some others specific to your area. Some common employer benefits are health, dental, and vision insurance. Some of you will be covered under your parents' plans, which is great, but you won't be able to be covered for, by them forever. Usually there is a cost to the employee to have these types of health insurance benefits, and you will see those deducted from your paycheck. Disability insurance. This provides income to, in the event that you become disabled while working. And retirement or a pension plan. You may also be able to contribute money to a retirement plan that your employer sets up for you. And we'll talk about more, more on this later. Once you take all of these deductions into account, you will find that your net pay may only be 70 to 80% of your gross pay. So now let's turn our attention to managing that 70 to 80% the best we can on your own. In order to know how much of your paycheck you should deposit or save versus spend, it helps to have some financial goals. Goals can be broken up into short or long-term goals. Short-term goals typically are goals you want to achieve within three to 12 months. Things like having money for a concert at the end of the summer or for a new, a new tablet. Long-term goals are something that may take you more than a year to accomplish, like saving for a new car, saving for college, or even retirement. A savings account will make it easier to reach your goals. If you don't have a savings account yet, consider opening one. Many financial institutions offer special accounts just for teens and youth like Horizons Explore Checking and Explore Savings Accounts. In order to accomplish your goals, you will want to make sure that they are smart. S is for specific. This is the what, where, and when, and how. The more specific you can be, the better. You'll want your goals to be measurable. Determine how you can measure your progress. Your goals should be attainable. Good goals should be challenging, but not impossible. They should also be realistic or relevant. Your goals should be something that matters to you. And timely. Set a time frame to accomplish your goal to help keep you focused. For example, one of your goals might look something like this. I will set aside $20 from each paycheck starting on June 15th so that I have $100 by August 1st to buy the concert tickets when they go on sale. If you're going to try to set aside a certain amount per paycheck, consider creating a budget. A budget is essentially money in versus money out. Some typical expenses include um, setting aside money for your goals, uh, you're setting aside money for your savings account, uh, spending on gas, food, your cell phone, entertainment, clothing, uh, any of those personal care items that you might need, and then also uh, attributing for spending for charity, churches, and gifts that might um, come up. Keep in mind that the money in doesn't have to come strictly from your job. This would include any money that you get from allowance, odd jobs, or gifts. When creating your budget, get your parents' input as well. Now that you are working, they may have certain expectations about which expenses you will now have to cover. Once you determine your income and your expenses, you'll need to make sure you are on track with spending. Have you ever had a lot of cash one moment and then a few days later, or a few hours later to be frank, it disappears and you're left to be, wonder where it went? Tracking what you spend your money on will help you decide if your spending is in line with your goals and your plan. Remember, if your income or expenses change, you will need to revise your budget. Some people like using a simple notebook to keep a diary of sorts to track their spending. Don't forget about technology. There are many free smartphone apps that make it easier to track your spending. Horizon offers a money manage management tool that tracks expenses within online banking and online or mobile banking as well. Let's look at, a, at an example of a student trying to follow a budget. So this student makes $60 per month. 
That's enough to pay for his cell phone bill and have $20 left over for going out with his friends. So it's the middle of the month and he spent $16 of his entertainment money. He now has $44 left, but only $4 is left for entertainment. What if his friends asked him to join him at the movies, which will cost $12? What would you do and why? So in that scenario, uh, if you're on with us, go ahead and type in the chat. What would you do? Would you go to the movies and spend the $12 even though you don't technically have it on paper or would you wait? All right, I'm seeing some wait responses, which is good. Uh, hopefully in this scenario, he would realize that this would be a bad idea since spending $12 now would leave him short when it comes time to pay his cell phone bill. Every day you'll encounter decisions on what to do with your money and some choices may be tougher than others. So sometimes saying no to the friends going to the movies is gonna be harder than um, you know, just bucking up and doing it. All right, at the bottom of your screen is a raise your hand button. Uh, click that button if you have ever purchased something and regretted it later. I know many of us have. <laughs> it's hard not to do. Um, and in the chat, is there anyone that would like to share what, what happened to them? Give it just a second here if anyone wants to share. There may have been a time that you found the same shirt as your favorite Instagram influencer, um, but then once you bought it, you were too embarrassed to wear it that evening. Um, or it could be a large food order. You felt hungry and you purchased a lot more food than you really should have. And now that food has gone to waste and that money is gone. Spending impulsively can destroy a budget, even when it looks good on paper. Think ahead about how you will combat impulsive spending to avoid having buyer's remorse. Maybe carry less cash with you when you go to the mall or never buy an expensive item unless you sleep on it first. What are some, what are some other ideas for controlling the urge to splurge? If you have input on what you do to um, control the urge to splurge, share that in the chat. That might help another panelist or another participant here. The daily decisions you make about where to spend your money may seem ins insignificant compared to a variety of large decisions on your horizon, like what to do after high school. You can enter the workforce, workforce full-time or go to a two-year community college. Maybe you're thinking about, about attending a trade school or going to a four-year college. Let's see what you're thinking. So just think about that for a second. What's, what's your plan after high school? For those that may not be heading to, high, to school right now, it's still nice to know about your options in case you decide to attend at some point in the future. Planning for college is not a one-time event. It can be a long process, but the sooner you start to plan ahead, the better. Let's watch a quick video discussing some of these options. Good morning, adventurers. My name is Raymond, and I will be your nature guide today. Do you have any questions? Are there bears in these woods? I do not know. What's the history of this trail? Anybody else? What should I do after high school? Yes, love it. Let's talk it out. It's not just about what you'll be doing next fall. You're choosing a path for your entire future. Yikes. One option is to further your education. That can mean college, university, trade school, online courses, apprenticeships, workshops, or anything in between. 
Further education feels like a logical next step. And in general, it does give you access to higher paying jobs. Uh-huh. Great. College it is. But degrees can be pricey. When you factor in tuition, student loans, and interest, you're looking at a major debt decision that you'll likely be paying for long after you've graduated. But going to school will allow me to make more money in the long run. So it balances out, right? Possibly. But it's more than just an economic comparison. You have to consider the time investment and the dedication required. It means asking yourself if you're motivated enough by the outcome to give years of your life toward education. When you put it that way, I'm not so sure. Another option is to work after high school and start making money right away. Without tuition or student loans to pay for, your money can go toward other experiences and savings goals. That sounds kind of cool. It gives you real exposure to an industry and can help you discover whether or not it's something you're truly passionate about. You can pick up some practical skills and your work experience may even lead to future employment opportunities. But work experience can only take you so far. Depending on the industry, you may need formal education or other training to advance beyond a certain point. Well, now I feel even more lost. Look, you may think your path needs to look something like this, but it'll probably end up looking more like this. And every path has obstacles. A fear of failure, a lack of direction, the expectations of family and friends, financial stress. Can't I just avoid them? Not entirely, but if you're well equipped, you won't lose your footing. Getting to know yourself is a good start. What are your strengths and limitations? What do you want out of life? Next, feed your curiosity. What careers are you interested in and how can you really explore those areas? Then design a path that gives you both flexibility to adapt and the opportunity to explore. A career counselor or coach can be a helpful guide. That makes sense. Thanks. Of course. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Is this nature hike still on? Because everybody's gone. Ugh, not again. This always happens. <laughs> What kind of trees are these? I have no idea. All right, we'll get back to our presentation here. I love those videos. All right, so thank you so much, Amy. There are many choices that impact college costs as well. In-state schools can be much more affordable than out-of-state schools. There can be a very large difference between resident and non-resident tuition at some pub public colleges. Living off campus is usually less expensive than living on campus. However, you'll need to consult with the college you attend to confirm that students are allowed to live off campus as some colleges bar freshmen from living off campus. If you attend a community college for two years, tuition can be reduced significantly. While the college experience at a four-year college is something to be considered, so are the additional years of paying back your student loans. Now we'll discuss some of the ways to pay for a college education. If you haven't already, you'll want to talk with your family about how you're going to pay for college. Do you have a college fund? If so, find out how much you have and what the rules are for using this money. For example, some plans will require you to go to school in-state, while others will allow you to use the money to pay for off-campus housing. Page six in your workbook will detail these options as well. So apply for scholarships. Scholarships are funds awarded by a school, organization, church, etc., to help you pay for some or all of your school expenses. Scholarships are often awarded based on academic merit, but can also be awarded for other things like community service. This money does not have to be paid back. Depending on the scholarship, you may also have to attend a certain school as well. So where might you look for these scholarships? Your high school guidance counselor is a great place to start when looking for scholarships. The schools you're applying to may offer scholarships specifically for their students. The internet has a wealth of resources, just be sure that you don't use any websites that charge a fee. You may also want to check with any local groups you belong to, including your parents' employers, your congregation at church, or even a local credit union. Horizon offers scholarships at a handful of colleges throughout our footprint. To find out more or apply, reach out to your college's financial aid office directly to inquire. 
Grants are similar to scholarships in that they don't have to be paid back, but are given out based on financial need. They're usually awarded by your state or the federal government. Some schools also give out grants as well. Part of your federal financial aid package might include work study. Here, you have a job set aside for you on campus. Work study jobs tend to have more flexibility if you need time off to do schoolwork. If you're not able to cover all of your college costs with the options we've discovered previously, then you may have to take out student loans. Student loans are loans borrowed specifically for education expenses. The loans must be paid back with interest. Loans can come from the federal government or from private lenders. If you're among the 70% or so of students who opt to take out student loans, the loan choices can seem overwhelming. Let's spend some time reviewing the features of the different loan programs. To get any type of grant or student loan, you will need to fill out the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, or FAFSA, on or after October 1st. Fill this out as early as possible after October 1st of your senior year of high school. Some financial aid runs out and later applicants who are eligible may be denied funds due to a lack of availability. Eligibility is good for one academic year, which runs from July 1st through June 30th. You'll fill out a renewal form each year you attend school. To fill out the FAFSA, go to www.fafsa.ed.gov. Once the FAFSA has been processed, you will receive a student aid report or SAR. The SAR verifies the information that you provided is complete. The SAR also lists an expected family contribution or EFC amount. When the officials evaluate the finances, take into consideration, excuse me, they take into consideration a number of factors, including parental and student income and assets, the number of family members in college, and how far your parents are away from retirement age. This data is used to determine how much your parents are expected to contribute. The need is then calculated as the difference between the expected contribution and the costs of the college that you're considering attending. This number is critical because it's used to determine your eligibility for many grants, scholarships, loans, and other financial aid. Once the FAFSA has been sent to the school you apply to, their financial aid office determines what type of aid package they can put together for you. The financial aid officer can discuss with you all the details associated with their aid evaluation. Each school that you apply to may offer a different package based on costs and availability of their funds. For example, you may qualify for substantial aid at an expensive private college, but may not qualify for any aid at a less costly state university. Subsidized loans are for students who meet a financial needs test. The government pays all the interest costs on the amount borrowed while you're in school. The interest rate offered changes each academic year, but once you take out a loan, the rate does not change. Unsubsidized loans are for students who do not meet a financial needs test or who need to supplement their subsidized loans. Interest will accrue while you're in school, and when you are in the repayment period, the interest rates on unsubsidized loans are the same as subsidized. Parent PLUS loans are taken out by your parents or guardians. A creditworthy parent may borrow up to the total cost of college attendance, minus any other aid you receive. The program is available to parents at all income levels, regardless of need. The interest rate on PLUS loans is 2.6% higher than subsidized or unsubsidized loans. And additional origination fees may apply. Finally, there's private student loans. These are originated by, the, by a private lender and do not include the benefits and protections available with federal student loans. Interest rates, fees, repayment terms, and benefits are determined by the financial institution and may vary greatly. Because of this, you should exhaust all federal student loan options before applying for private loans. And so now that your loan options are a little bit clearer, let's fast forward a little bit. So you've picked out your school, you've found a way to pay for it, and now you're on campus. If your parents are helping you with some of your monthly expenses, find out how much they're going to contribute. If your parents are not able to help financially, you have some options. Did you work during the summer? 
perhaps you can put aside money to help during the year. Will grant or scholarship awards help to pay for some expenses? Can you get a part-time job during school? If you do opt for the part-time job option, just make sure that you don't overdo it, especially if you're taking a full load of classes. Wherever your income comes from, you will continue to have many spending choices ahead of you. You will want to create a budget just like you did well in high school to determine how much you can spend and where your money is going. You may have some new expenses too, like food outside of your meal plan, books, and additional school supplies. As you budget, having a checking account will make it easier to manage your bills and will allow you to avoid having to carry too much cash. If you haven't opened a checking account yet, it may be time to consider it. Many credit unions have free or low fee accounts specifically designed for students. Horizon offers their Explore checking option. It may be a good idea to have one or both of your parents on your account so that they can deposit money and any other necessary tasks for you in the event of an emergency. Most credit unions also have free online banking, apps and mobile alerts to help you. Having a checking account is a big responsibility and it's a great way to help establish a relationship with a financial institution. All right, thanks Jen for that information. We're going to fast forward again. Um, and now in your life, you're ready to enter the workforce. This can be an exciting time for sure. Finding a full-time job and moving out on your own are things we dream about during our high school years. However, this can be a tricky time financially. You are earning a full-time wage, but you may have student loans and other new, new expenses. It can be tempting to move out on your own once you have started that full-time job. A few words of caution, be sure to map out all of your expenses before signing a rental agreement. Some expenses to consider include rent, of course, but also utilities, furniture, transportation expenses, including car payments, public, public transit, gas, insurance, tolls, and other charges, groceries, clothing, entertainment, and student loan payments. These are also listed on page 10 in your workbook. It's important to think about all of your expenses now that you will most likely be not be able to rely on mom and dad anymore. Consider if getting a roommate or two to help offset some of the expenses is a good choice for you. You may also want to see if your parents might let you live at home for a little while so you can save up some money. Remember, living with your folks will not be forever and it can really help start you po your post-college life on the right foot financially. One of the largest expenses you may have right now is your student loans. Let's figure out how to best manage them. When you graduate or withdraw from school, you have a grace period before your loan payments start. Subsidized and unsubsidized loans have a six month grace period. Once the grace period ends, we encourage you to choose the option that makes the most sense for your budget and long-term goals. Let's review some of your repayment options. The standard repayment plan will be in effect unless you request otherwise. This plan is usually set up to pay off debt over a 10 year period. Graduated plans start with a small amount and the payment automatically goes up every two years. Before choosing this option, you'll want to consider whether or not your income is likely to increase substantially in the future. An extended repayment plan stretches out how long you'll take to pay down your loans, which means significantly more interest. We'll see an example of this shortly. There are also a number of income-driven plans, which we'll also discuss shortly. If you really wanna see what your student loan payments may look like, check out www.studentloans.gov. There is a loan simulator under the Manage Loans tab. You can either download your actual loan data or put in estimates of what you think you'll borrow in the future. This example shows the options available for a student who borrowed approximately $30,000. In this case, the standard 10-year repayment plan results in, higher, in a higher payment of $360 per month 
but has the least amount of interest. The monthly payment with an extended fixed repayment plan stays low at $206 per month, but notice that the payment that they pay $18,000 more in interest than the standard 10-year plan. There are several options to lower your payments based on your income and household size. First, there's Income Contingent Repayment, or ICR. This is the only income-driven option for Parent PLUS loans. Please note that the loans must be consolidated first to be able to be eligible for the ICR. For students who went to school before 2011, there's an income-based repayment or IBR available. Pay as you earn was created for newer borrowers. Recently, revised pay as you earn or repay, R-E-P-A-Y-E, -E, launched. This program will make income-driven plans available to more borrowers. Visit www.ibrinfo.org and they have some great resources explaining these options further. You can also click on the orange calculator in the top right side of the IBR info page to take you directly to the Department of Education's payment estimator that we mentioned earlier. That's that orange button uh, on your screen there. There's even an option to forgive your loans if you work for a nonprofit organization or government agency. For details, visit www.studentloans.gov. With your student loans under control, hopefully you can leave some room for savings. Consider setting aside 10% or more of your earnings into savings. Here are some different savings goals to consider. Emergency savings. You should strive to save three to six months of your living expenses in a separate account in the event that you lose your job. If you are in a specialized field or have less job stability, you may want to aim to have nine months of emergency savings on hand. Goals. Depending on your long and short-term goals, you may want to set up separate savings accounts to help you track your progress as you work towards achieving these goals, like saving to buy a new car, saving for a down payment on a home or for a new laptop. And retirement. Even though you are young, it's never too early to start saving for retirement. Many employers offer plans and some will help fund your account either through a, a pension program or by matching your contributions. You can even open your own retirement account. It's a good idea to meet with a financial planner to talk about your options and create a plan of action. Just as important as developing a good savings habit is building a good credit habit. Can anyone think of why having credit is important? If you have some ideas, feel free to fill those in in the chat. Yeah, so you're gonna need to have a good proof of credit when you apply for employment, uh, when renting an apartment, buying a home or a car. Uh, your credit will definitely determine your in car insurance rates and the interest rates you'll pay when you borrow money. So we'll kind of dive into that as we move forward here. Credit is a way of having something now and paying for it later. If you are a student who is under 21 and applying for a credit card, you will be required to obtain a co-signer who is at least 21 years of age. Most likely this will be a parent. Uh, and this person has to have good credit, or you will be required to prove that you have an independent source of income. While this may sound harsh, it is designed to protect you from getting into a lot of credit card debt before you even graduate from college. Using a credit card responsibly is one tool to build credit. We'll discuss responsible use of credit shortly. There are other ways you can help yourself establish a good credit history. Consider the following. You could open a secured credit card. After you make a deposit, you receive a card with a limit equal to that deposit. A secured loan is where you make a deposit that's used to make an automatic payment to pay back the loan. And store or retail credit cards and gas cards are usually easier to obtain than all purpose cards like a Visa or MasterCard. These cards typically carry interest rates in excess of 
So be sure to pay back any balances in full. Piggybacking off someone else's credit can work, but be cautious. You have two choices here. Getting a co-signer for loans or getting a joint account for credit cards. Both parties are legally liable for the debt. If you plan to co-sign, you are prepared to take over the loan or credit card, are you prepared to take over the credit card payments or the, on the loan? If you plan to use a co-signer, are you ready to jeopardize the relationship with your family member or friend if something goes wrong? Being added as an authorized user on a credit card is generally much safer than co-signing or having a joint account holder. Basically, you have the ability to use the credit card but are not liable for any charges. The activity on the account, however, can show up on your credit report and be reflected in your credit score. Credit can be expensive if not used wisely. As the slide shows, if you make a large purchase on credit and only make the minimum payment each month, the actual cost of the item you purchase will be significantly higher than the original purchase price. You can minimize the cost by making more than the minimum payment each month. Just think, after that $5,000 purchase is paid off in nearly 15 years, will you even remember that what it was, what the charge was for? Chances are you might not even have that item any longer. When reviewing your application for credit, lenders usually use a credit scoring model. The factors used in the model are commonly referred to as the three C's, capacity, capital, and character. Capacity. Capacity looks at whether you have financial capacity to take on the credit you are seeking. Creditors look at your income and your other financial obligations to determine if you can handle additional debt. Capital. Creditors will look for what assets and resources you have. When evaluating capital, creditors will want the assurance that a debt could be paid for from your assets. And character. Character is often the most important aspect to the majority of creditors. They will want to know how you handle your other debt obligations. Creditors often rely on credit reports to determine your character. They may also verify information provided by you on your application to de determine its accuracy. Let's briefly review what is contained in your credit report, as well as how your credit score is calculated. Your credit report is a report of your credit history. Credit reporting agencies keep and organize this information. The information is provided to them when you apply for credit by creditors with whom you do business and through public records. There are three major credit bureaus in the United States, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. Their contact information is listed on page 14 in your workbook. You won't know which credit bureaus may be used by a lender, so make a decision. For this reason, it is important to review your credit reports from all three credit bureaus on a regular basis. Through the Fair Credit Reporting Act, you are able to obtain one copy of a credit report from each bureau for free one time per year. This can be done at www.annualcreditreport.com. Checking your credit reports will also make it easier for you to catch fraud or identity theft. Thank you so much, Amy. Great information. So a credit score, like she said, is a three-digit number that tries to quantify the likelihood of you repaying something. It's meant to reflect your credit risk. People often wonder what a good credit score is. Essentially, a good credit score is a number that matches with the level of risk a lender is willing to accept for a particular loan or credit card. So basically, that's just that there's not an easy answer for that. It depends on, like I said, what the lender is willing to accept. The lower score, the higher the risk. So when you have a low score, you will pay more to borrow money. And when you have a higher score, you'll be offered a better interest rate, which will cost you less because the lender is not taking as much of a risk by lending to you. Your credit score is based on the factors we see on this slide. Payment history. 
pay your bills on time. The amounts owed, don't max out your credit cards. The length of credit history, have patience. It'll take several years for the length of your credit history to build itself up. New credit, don't apply for credit card credits too often, or excuse me, credit accounts too often. Types of credit, a mix of loans and credit cards helps, but don't overdo it again. Income, employment, where you live, race, age, gender, religion, national origin, and marital status are factors that are not included in, in determining your credit score. So as you can see though, that payment history, biggest part, pay your bills on time. You may be anxious to boost your credit score by applying for a credit card, but before you do, let's review a few things. Without stable income, a credit card can easily become a crutch. It's less about the amount of income and more about the consistency of it. Even if you have a limited income, as long as it's dependable and you live within your means, you're unlikely to incur debt. Uh, and then you can outspend any income. You can outspend any income if you're not careful. Credit cards make it a lot easier to feel like you can afford that unrealistic lifestyle. Even with secured credit cards, it's important to have money and savings as a backup. Remember, you can't use the security deposit to pay the credit card unless you close the entire account. And if you have no savings and a financial emergency pops up, you might have to turn to your credit card and get trapped into a cycle of debt. Let's review some tips for using a credit card wisely. Having money in, the sa in savings as a backup so that you can handle an unexpected expense without getting into debt using your credit card is a great place to start. Consider only making one charge a month and make this charge an automatic bill, such as your internet or cell phone service. The reason we suggest setting up only one automatic charge is that you only need to generate activity to build your credit score. It doesn't matter how much activity. In fact, the smaller the balance, the lower your utilization. And as we've learned, that accounts for the second most uh, majority of your credit score at 30%. So setting up an automatic charge ensures that you will not succumb to temptation when it comes to overspending and just swiping that darn credit card. The lower the utilization, the better. A general rule of thumb is to use less than one third of your available credit. For a small limit, this might mean only charging a very small amount. While paying off an account in full does not improve your credit score per se, paying it on time is what really matters, paying off the balance in full will prevent any finance charges from accruing. It will also help you to live within your means without increasing any your debt load. And finally, check your credit report and score regularly for accuracy. You wanna be ahead of the curve if something is going wrong, something doesn't seem right in there. So just stay on top of it and you won't have as big of a mess to clean up, hopefully. If you follow the steps we've discussed, you'll have excellent credit, minimal debt, and a solid budget with substantial savings. This is such an exciting time in your life with a lot of decisions to make. While you're still young, it's important to look at each step as an opportunity to learn about personal finance and grow. The lessons learned for now, excuse me, the lessons learned now will help to set you up for a lifetime of success. I hope this workshop has been helpful for folks. Does anybody have any questions that came up during that? I know we covered a lot of information. If you do, you can raise your hand or type it in the chat. Feel free. All right, I'm not seeing anything from anyone yet, so we'll move on here. Um, please, if something pops up, just, just start typing in the chat and we'll address it. So Green Path Financial Wellness is available for Horizon members via hzcu.org, directly at the link shown on the screen here or at this 1877 phone number listed. And finally, Continue your financial journey at the Financial Training Ground on hzcu.org. Explore a variety of topics, including interactive guides at the top link shown, or create a personalized financial education